Hi there, welcome to Chemistry 3007, Approximate Wave Functions at the University of Western Australia. I want to start this mini lecture uh, just to review what we've done. We've talked about the Schrodinger equation, the time dependent one. We've talked about deriving the time independent Schrodinger equation. We've talked a lot about the born upper Heimer approximation and how that's necessary for making molecular structure by forcing the nuclei to have point-like positions and how we separate out uh, the electronic and nuclear motions and the nuclear motions themselves are separated out further into vibration, rotation and translation. Right, from now on what we're going to do is concentrate on approximating this electronic wave function. The first wave function in this series of products here which make up the Born-Oppenheimer. And we're going to do that because we can't get exact solutions in general. So here we're talking about approximate wave functions. And we're going to talk about the different types of simple wave functions, such as the Hartree product wave function, the Hartree Fock equation, which is an anti symmetrized version of the Hartree Fock. Uh, we will talk a little bit about DFT wave functions, but not much. And finally, MP2 wave functions. And in all of these types of wave functions, we can have either restricted or unrestricted types of theories. Basically, those involve theories where alpha and beta electrons, up and down spin electrons, are forced to occupy the same spatial regions of space and where they are not, when they're not restricted to occupying the same region of space. So that's where we're headed. So we are now in this fourth mini lecture, finally going to talk about the simplest wave functions, the Hartree product wave function. So what is it? The Hartree product wave function is, and this is the electronic wave function phi e, I'm going to drop the e now because we're just talking about electrons. The Hartree product wave function is a product of one electron spin orbitals. So the phi involving all the coordinates of the electrons is now separated into a product of separate functions. Phi 1, which is a function only of the electrons of coordinate 1, times phi 2, not written here, which is only a function of electrons coordinates 2. And by the way, these coordinates include spatial and spin coordinates. Remember, electrons are essentially four-dimensional objects. They have x, y, z, and an internal coordinate. So that's the product of the first two, and then that's all the same up to the nth electron, which is a function of the nth electron's coordinates. This is a Hartree product wave function, and it's basically separation of variables on steroids. That's what it is. We already did that, separation of variables to separate the time component from the space component. Now we're separating out the space components all separately. Okay. Now, let me say a few things about this. This is Hartree here, Doug, Douglas Hartree, quite an impressive guy. Um, he used this kind of wave function to support the existence of zero-point motion in 1928, only a few years after Schrodinger had derived his equation. So according to Froze Fisher, Charlotte Froze Fisher, he got a little bit pissed off when Fock beat him to publishing about the anti-symmetry requirement, the Pauli principle. Uh, I don't know why it's called the Pauli principle, because Fock actually was the one who, who proposed the anti-symmetric wave function idea. This wave function is wrong, as you know, because it's not anti-symmetric, but it's simple and it kind of works. It's a good starting point. Now, Hartree did realise this, but Unfortunately, when we talk about the next one, Fock beat him to that. Anyway, here's the paper by James uh, Waller and Hartree. James and Waller were very uh, good scientists working in X-ray diffraction. And I think it's interesting that the very first applications of quantum chemistry were in crystallography. So I just mentioned that I'm a bit of a crystallographer myself. And uh, it refers to earlier work of James and Miss Firth, in those days, I'm not sure they put uh, ladies on papers. 
unless they had to, they're very old fashioned. So you can see there's a lot of discrimination against women in the history of science, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully that is disappearing these days. We can't afford to waste brain talent and we won't anymore. We need you, ladies. So here is a graph from that paper where they calculate the scattering power, actually a combination of scattering powers from the chlorine and the sodium, and they compare it to calculations. The measured values are in um, the circles, the observations and the calculated values are the calcula uh, obviously from the Hartree wave function. And they get remarkably good agreement for the sodium chloride crystal in 1928, uh, uh, this was the time when they had the very first um, electronic computers, so uh, everything was really very advanced in those days. Now, with, I think this is amazing. Now, you only get this agreement if you incorporate zero-point motion. If you don't do that, the agreement is much worse. So that more or less proves that zero point motion has to be there. It's not a direct measurement, but if you don't put it in the model, it just doesn't agree. So that's normally how you test whether things exist or not. All right, see you later. <laughs>